Good morning, folks, and uh, welcome to our COIL conversation today. It's a pleasure to have you here on a somewhat overcast July day in State College, Pennsylvania, but um, hopefully it's nice and bright and sunny where you are. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome my colleague and, um, and uh, uh, what should I say, a, a partner in um, the exploration of online innovations and how they impact learning, uh, Joanna DeFranco. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joanna is an assistant professor of software engineering at our Penn State Great Valley campus. Has been a long time involved in uh, technology and education. I've known Joanna for quite a few years. Uh, she was also a COIL rig recipient from 2013. And she's going to share a bit of her study with us today about online team collaboration. Um, it's long been recognized that uh, team and group work are critical soft skills for employees entering the workforce. Therefore, an important skill set for us to be preparing our students with. Uh, it's also universally loved and hated, maybe frustrated is a better term, for both uh, students and faculty. Uh, trying to get it right in the design, using these projects, can really be uh, quite challenging. But Joanna's work has been to dig in a little bit to these uh, dynamics and help us understand how to do a better job. So, uh, Joanna, welcome to Penn State. Joanna's, uh, we have the pleasure of her being with us at Penn State today for a bunch of reasons, but it's uh, terrific to have you here. I just want to throw in Joanna he is a Penn State alum. I won't say what year because I don't know, but <laughs> she's a uh, she has a BS in electrical engineering and math from Penn State. So welcome aboard, Thank Joanna. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, I guess I'll just go right into it. You uh, mentioned a few things that I'll bring up about uh, teamwork and, and groups in in projects and in education. Um, so, just to give you a little perspective, uh, my students take uh, courses that are seven weeks in duration, and they're usually part-time graduate students. Uh, so, uh, I want you to just for a minute think back, and maybe you were a part-time graduate student, and think how you felt. Uh, you, you, you work all day, uh, you, have a, you have a lot of obligations, you might have a family, and now you are sitting in a class um, twice a week. Um, or even if it's online, uh, you have an obligation now uh, to do your, your schoolwork. And your professor now says, we have a team project to do for the semester, and it's half of your grade. So um, I know back when I was a, a graduate student, I was a part-time uh, graduate student, and I was not happy when I heard those words. Because now, not only do I have to manage all those other things in my life, I have to coordinate with these four or five people and back at a time where there was no Skype, um, there was no Google chat or whatever, uh, Google groups, <laughs> whatever they call those things. And um, you know, so I had to coordinate getting to places and meeting these people. And even now, uh, my students online, they are all over the world. So they have to manage the time zones and figure out how to get together. So it's, it's not that easy. But we do it because we, we know for sure it's a benefit. Right? We know for sure the students are definitely benefiting from a group project, um, I guess. Right? So that, that's really where this came from. Am I sure that the individual student on a team is going to benefit from this project? Now, I know um, back from when I was an engineer, oops, sorry, um, that group projects um, are, you know, engineering projects have to be done in teams. So they're too complex to do alone. And, uh, but what I found was that there was more cooperation than collaboration. So just to put that in other terms, it is more of a group than a team. So uh, where a group is uh, and a team both have a goal in the end, uh, but the team members actually have a, a vested interest in holding everyone accountable. So they will hold you accountable. Um, they're going to hold you accountable. Where in cooperating in groups, you know, I know you're working on your part, and when we get to the end, it'll probably come together. But in an engineering project, when you do that, that doesn't come without firefighting and rework. Um, you probably didn't understand the requirements um, exactly. Um, so collaboration, you know, is more effective. Uh, but we don't always do it. It's actually a skill we have to learn to do. So when I'm in class, I try to um, tell my students, um, I, I give them an analogy of, a, a band um, versus a drumming circle. So in a band, like think about the blue bands, how orchestrated they are, how skilled, how practiced. 
Um, everybody has their part. They're definitely holding each other accountable to the beat. And it comes out really great in the end. Beautiful song. Um, but the drum circle is something more random. Um, if, if you went to a music store and signed up to come there at 10 o'clock to bring your drum, they're all sitting in, a, in an actual circle, banging your drum. And eventually, as they do it together, it comes together at the end. It, it probably sounds OK. But it's definitely not the cadence you would get from, from the drum core uh, from the blue bands. So, so, that, so I think you, know, you get it. That's, that's really the goal is collaboration, not cooperation. So when I started this research, I was um, trying to figure out a way to make engineering teams um, more collaborative and more effective. So I um, have a five-part multifaceted study that I did, and my COIL grant comes at number five. But I need to tell you just real quick what one through four was. Um, the, fir the first study I did was um, I came up with a model to make the teams more effective. And I proved that the projects were more effective. So that was great. So then, uh, continuing on, I wanted to see if the groups that were now I knew were effective, uh, did they learn more? Did that team actually together? So you know, very simply, I looked at their grades. And, and those teams, and I always had a control group that did not have access to this model that I had that made them more effective. So I compare the grades, and the uh, team that used my model was always more effective. So that's number two, check. Number three, I wanted to see why. So what I did was I had the teams draw a concept map, or really a mind map of their project. And I measured mathematically that the teams that used my model, their maps were more convergent. They were more the same than the maps drawn by people who didn't use the model. So again, that was great. So, so I figured out why my mod, the CCM worked. It was called the Cognitive Collaborative Model. I'm just going to call it the CCM. So then, number four, I wanted to see, um, now that I know that, that the team is effective, I know the team is learning, is the individual student on that team learning more than if they were on a team that was not as effective, a team that did not use my model. Um, and I found out they did not. So um, I, you know, it, that's good and bad. I mean, your paper might not be, you know, is easily published, um, but it brings on number five. So I had to figure out a, a way to improve that individual learning, and that's where my COIL grant uh, came into play. Oh. So um, just to tell you a little bit about the model, it's, um, it essentially gets people on the same page. Um, and they are more effective during, and I, uh, during software development and analysis. And that's, that's my uh, focus of study. So that's, um, that's what I was looking at. Um, and this is just a mind map of the model, a part of it. Um, so this is the first two stages. Each stage here has three phases. So for example, stage one is called problem formulation. Then I have three stages they go through. And we'll just look at the top one, preliminary problem description. And I have them do these tasks. And, and if you look at them, you're going to think, well, they're easy, you know? But, and they're obvious, but not really. Because usually when a person goes into a, a project, they just want to start implementing. You know? and, that's, and there's studies to show that the least amount of time is spent on the problem analysis. So in that case, if you're just starting your end and I'm starting mine and we don't understand the problem, What's, you're going to do the cooperation again. You're not, you're not collaborating. So this is to facilitate uh, the teams to get on the same page, to understand the problem they're solving. So that's all the third level of that mind map are all the activities for those two phases. And again, there were six phases, but the first two are the most important in this. So here's an expanded version of one phase in one stage. And you'll see it's a bunch of questions. And this um, reminded me of, um, I don't know if you've heard of Alistair Coburn. He, is, he really facilitated agile programming. And he always said, if you have, or if someone is not, doesn't have the same opinion as you, or if they are, have a disagreement, ask questions. And, and don't just be defensive about it, but ask questions. And that's what this speaks to, um, that you're, you're asking questions to see what that person thinks. And they should be asking you. And that's, that is you know, the team holding each other accountable, making sure we're on the same page. So when you see, for example, the collaborative side effects there, I have conflict, but I put in parentheses, good. That's good, because you're, you're asking each other, is a conflict about how you think about it and how I think about it, but we're going to get on the same page by these questions. So this is good that we're having this conflict and this discussion. 
it means that there's a trust in that team that they're able to ask each other questions. And then that brings on a side effect of cognitive synchronization. So they're now on the same page. And there are, you know, if you don't do that, you get the other side effects that I have there is eagerness, that you're going to start solving the problem before you understand it. And you have team members, we know that, this is part of the annoyance of team projects, is that you have people that don't do their jobs, you have free riders. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the basis of each one of those phases in uh, the model. Okay, I don't know if I'm, what I'm pointing at here. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so far what I've told you is that the uh, CCM is effective. Um, that team performance was improved, uh, and then we, I found out that team learned, there was a team mental model, um, but now I want to uh, figure out how to make the individuals more effective on the team. So that brought me to my uh, coil rig grant, and I wanted to come up with a framework where uh, collaboration was still effective, and also the individual on the team was going to learn more, and that would make it worth it. Besides, you know, team projects, maybe there's less grading. Am I allowed to say that? That's, that's another benefit, of our silent benefit. Um, but really, we want the students to learn more. Uh, so what I designed was a mixed method study. Um, a technique that I'll get to is to facilitate the individual learning. And then I performed a quantitative analysis, which to see that it worked, I did a post-test and a pre-test and looked at the differential. And then a qualitative research to really find the roadblocks the students were experiencing Doing, going through this process. So um, what I implemented was peer tutoring. And I did not find that any other studies actually implemented this online, ever. So I was on my own here. So I made up my own peer tutoring version online. Um, and I wanted to, to do that on an effective team. And what I mean by that is that they use the CCM. Okay. So, um, and then those two types of analysis. Okay, so this is, this is just summing up um, the different types of peer tutoring in the literature. So the first type is same level peer tutoring. So that's sort of what, what I had, um, where you have students in the same level, they're in the same class, and they <clears throat> are taking turns being a peer tutor in that, on the project. Uh, number two, you have the same level peer tutoring with students with the, a status that has increased because of the professor. So I might say, you know what, your, your professor or your student teacher of the day. Um, so that gives them a little higher status and they get to be the peer tutor. Uh, cross level, maybe you have someone that already took your class being the tutor. It's almost like a TA in the class uh, as, as that kind of design. And the fourth is having two different institutions. So we might send an undergraduate to an elementary school to do uh, peer tutoring. So those, that, that's what's established in the literature. And these were some of the studies that were done. I'm not, I don't expect you to read this, but what I wanted to show you was the last um, column, row there, it says peer-assisted distance learning. So there was something that was done online, but the peer tutors were trained face-to-face. -face. And that's the difference, because I couldn't do that. My classes were completely online, and again, I have students all over the world, so I could not uh, teach them or train them to be a peer tutor face-to-face. So what I did was I had four sections at my disposal, not all at the same time, over three semesters, and I implemented this peer tutoring and I performed the qualitative analysis. And that consisted of an open-ended survey to see who was actually interested in participating in this uh, analysis. And then once I did that, we found a few that wanted to actually do a phone interview. So that's, and that's where we got the qualitative data. We transcribed the interviews and then we looked for themes to again see what the roadblocks were to this process. And then after we did that uh, twice, we made adjustments to the model and then the last two sections was our final version of peer tutoring and that's where I got the quantitative data from. <clears throat> so the initial implementation, uh, I had students of three or four, I had each student take turns being the peer tutor, and I let them choose. I let them look at the syllabus and decide which uh, week they felt most comfortable being the tutor, and I also put, put it as part of the assessment that they had 12% uh, of their grade. Uh, so that first section had 22 students. I did the survey. I did the phone uh, interview. Actually, I didn't personally do it. I had someone else. I didn't, and also I didn't teach the class, so there was no bias there. 
Uh, but I wanted, I had someone with a doctorate in education uh, that was uh, unbiased and could do this uh, interview for me. Uh, then we together did the uh, analysis looking for the themes. Uh, so uh, what came out of it was there was an appreciation for the process. They liked having a tutor. Um, then, but negatively, there was a lack of confidence um, in the role of the tutor. And then they also provided some examples of improvement. So here's some of the data. Um, so appreciation. The these are quotes from, exact quotes from the students. They thought it was awesome. They have a lot of benefit being um, the peer tutor. Uh, it gave them another perspective being the teacher almost. And then they thought it helped tremendously. The second theme, lack of confidence, frightening. <laughs> Um, they wanted validation. They wanted some input from the instructor that they were saying the right thing to the students. They wanted that confirmation. Uh, they were a little shy about teaching and explaining. I mean, I guess if you think about it, they just are, you know, it's the first time they're taking the class too, and now you're asking them to be a tutor. <clears throat> so the recommendations were um, lesson plans uh, that they could have at their disposal. Um, I, they were thinking, you know, stop calling us a peer tutor. That's a little intimidating. And they also wanted to consolidate. And what they mean by that is I had a few discussion, or I had one discussion forum, and it, they were talking about the project, and they were doing the peer tutoring, and it was a little too um, overwhelming. So we uh, thought to split that up into two different discussion forums. So that's um, essentially what we did here. I instead of peer tutor, I called them a keystone. Um, I had more explicit instruction. We actually called them technical notes that we provided uh, to the, the student when they were the peer tutor that week. We emailed them the technical notes for that week, and that provided some guidance. We uh, added additional discussion forums to just have a place for the tutoring, and then um, we um, also had a team building uh, forum uh, because, you know, studies show that the teams really need to mature to you know, build the trust. So we thought, that's in the first week, instead of giving any tutoring, we're going to do some team building. And that was based off of a study with uh, team building questions. And they, they did that. So the second round, after fixing all that stuff, I had 26 students. And I had the same themes almost, again, um, appreciation for the peer tutor. Except this time, they actually had issues with peer engagement. Um, but, and they also had some recommendations. So let's look at what they said. Uh, the first theme, appreciation for peer interaction, uh, they learn from each other. And that's, you know, a given in, in studies. You, you always learn more when you teach versus when you're the student, right? Um, and then also, um, they thought that it was great being the tutor because it forced uh, responsibility on the, the team. And then also, um, they thought it was great being in a group because uh, there was a diverse uh, perspective. And, and that's always the case in our classes. Um, anyway, because again, they're from all over the world working at all different companies, so they all have a different way to apply this material. Issues with peer engagement, um, and that, that can be difficult um, in any case, even for the instructor, to, to motivate someone to participate. So um, one, and, uh, two, these two particular students, they said they had to wait uh, until the student, and you know, sometimes they don't work until, on until the weekend, um, where, so they missed all that time during the week, and then another one, um, they thought that the answers just kept getting repeated. They really, and probably that speaks to the fact that they needed more training and tutoring. Um, and then recommendations, they, they wanted more people on their team. And I, that probably speaks to the fact that they were waiting for certain people. If they had some other people that would participate more, that would help. So uh, this time, and this was my last implementation, I increased it to five or six. And I encourage the instructor to really help facilitate the discussions, to keep a watch on that keystone discussion. Um, and I say here I removed the report. I didn't mention earlier that I actually had each tutor um, write down how each student participated. And I thought, let me just get rid of that, because I can see how they participated, because they're in the discussion forum. It's less work for them. And then I also changed the assessment to in, uh, include the quality of the interaction. So now they're a little more motivated to get them to participate and to maybe they can research a few things, a few questions uh, that the students ask. So um, these themes, and here I had a combination of everything that I had found out in the first two uh, running this. I had two sections now, 22 and 19. Um, I had again appreciation. They're still not confident in being the peer tutor. Um, there was, again, the uh, issue with the engagement. 
among the peers, and then they also provided some recommendations. So more of the same, they liked the peer tutoring. Um, here, again, they lacked confidence. Um, you know, they, they're just not sure that they're uh, saying the right things to the students. Um, the third, lost my connection again, is uh, they wanted um, to, to find, figure out a way to get more interaction from the students. And uh, it was, you know, tough for them to get the conversation going. And recommendations, they suggested how about um, more um, essays or maybe a questionnaire that they, the team could work on together. So the peer tutor would facilitate the answers and maybe help them answer it, but they would uh, participate and, and collaborate with their team to get the answers to, the, to a questionnaire. And they wanted something live. Like we have the asynchronous discussion forums. Um, they suggested using other software where they allow to use other software to have a synchronous conversation with their teams. So um, here is, is what I find the challenges. Uh, it's hard to, you know, force interaction and it's hard to motivate for the, the students, the peer tutors, to do that with their teams. Um, there's not enough training. Uh, they, the technical documents were not enough, um, you know, and, and things that I was thinking of afterwards, maybe I could create videos and uh, maybe I could talk to all the peer tutors together and have a train, a synchronous training session at the beginning of each week just for an hour. Um, so, it, and I think they're all related really to that third bullet, which depends on the quality of the instructor and the interaction that instructor has with the tutors. So that is really what this peer tutoring depends on. And it's not unlike the face-to-face -face version of the peer tutors. Those instructors trained their peer tutors, uh, you know, face-to-face. -face. So here comes the the answer, did, it, did they actually learn more once we did all of this implementation of peer tutoring? Uh, what were the results of my quantitative data? So I took a differential of a benchmark exam they took before they looked at any material, and uh, they had a final exam, and that differential, I wanted to see if there was a, a significant difference between the sections that had the CCM plus the peer tutoring against the classes that were ran, ran without either one of those things. So looking at the differential data, all normal. Uh, so I was, a, I was able to use a t-test. Um, and I found that it was not significantly different. The average was higher in my condition group, but only by two and a half uh, points, the, the differential. So again, I was only 32% confident that, that this actually worked. Um, so because of that, I decided, let me just look at the final exams. I just wanted to see. And that data was not normal. You can see there's outliers in that data. So um, there I had to do a couple of different tests because of that, and I found out the exams were almost four points higher in the condition group versus the, uh, the, uh, the, the control group, which, you know, it's, it's not that great. I mean, at least it was higher. You know, they weren't learning less, but they weren't learning significantly more. So, you know, I'm not sure it was worth all that, but maybe if I implemented those suggestions that I thought of later, um, that I could increase that score. So, but just an, a couple of issues uh, with the validity was that there was an, there, the, in, there was an iterator reliability problem. Um, the other rater, and again, I didn't teach the class and neither did um, the other rater. We both have taught the class. I actually designed the original class. Um, I, my, well, all right, I'll just, instead of saying my, rater one uh, was always <laughs> five points higher than rater two, and uh, it generally, overall. Um, so. What's legal there is to average the data because of that. So um, also, um, you know, we're thinking that there's not enough uh, data, right? So I mean, we had 118 points overall, 118 things each of us rated to, to figure out if there was a difference between us. But really, in the end, it wasn't a big sample. It was enough to do a statistical test, but not enough to say anything. Um, so what I want to do in the future is to have more training of my peer tutors, again, with the videos, maybe to have a synchronous meeting with them. And I, I also feel that because of our seven-week condensed courses, there's not enough time for that team to mature. And, and I just showed you there two uh, researchers that, you know, Kosenbach and Smith show that there's a team, um, this, is, this is a performance, my other graph is covering it, curve, uh, where the team needs time to mature into a high-performing perform, team. And, and we've all heard of Tuckman's model. Um, as well, where the team needs to, again, mature to a performing stage. 
And then I just found this um, optimal size of software teams. This was a study done in 2014 um, with some empirical data that the optimal size is four. Here I had five or six. So <laughs> maybe if I decrease that, and they and the data showed that the teams of four had less errors on their software. They did it faster. So um, just some, something to try. So um, you know, I'm interested to see if there's any comments or questions uh, from anyone here. We had uh, one question online from Jerry Breeze. Uh, what was the subject of the team project? Seems like the content to be learned would be a variable to be examined. Well, um, we had a, a project that was of equal complexity. Um, we had uh, one where they were designing a house, a futuristic house, and one that where they were designing a, an eBay type system. So uh, again, they weren't implementing anything. They were actually using uh, UML to uh, analyze and design it. Thanks. Short list of questions, as I promised okay. I would, because I, I love this stuff, and it sort of gets my brain going uh, a bit. Um, can I ask a clarifying question first? Did you say that students self-selected to serve in the role as a keystone? They were able to select which week they wanted to uh, be the peer tutor. So did all but they all had to do it. They all had to, they do, all it. Had to do it oh, eventually. Interesting. interesting. So it's a seven-week class, and we have uh, five weeks of tutors. And uh, so they, that's the four or five worked out there, oh, you know, so that they each chose. And now, if they had a team of four, I had someone do it twice. Okay. So, because um, the, uh, and I don't know whether you looked at this effect or not, but I'm just wondering what the effect of having served in the role of a tutor, a.k.a. Keystone, mm -hmm. um, would have on my subsequent participation as a participant on a team. In other words, once I'm in that teacher yes. role, now I'm put back into a team. Somebody else is the tutor. Right. Do I tend to more participate? Because I, I now have some empathy yes. with, oh, yeah, I remember when I was a tutor. Right. Darn, it was hard to get people to engage. I'm going to help out here. Yeah, and that was something we were thinking of later is could we quantify the participation yeah. uh, per student and see? And even another yeah. thing we were thinking yeah. of, that I, if, what I did um, recently was I looked at the exam questions and which week they mapped to. And then I also wanted to see if the grades improved that week for, um, for the teams. And so what I found was, um, because I wanted to see if team maturity was true. So I did find that in week seven, that question was the best. But I didn't, then when I looked at the question, I thought, oh, maybe it was an easy question. Mm. So I don't want to say that that was, you know, true yet, yeah. but I think I would redo my test. Yeah. And then also look at maybe the, t the peer tutor did better that week. Well, Because it's I'm, better, it's easier teaching, or you learn more from you teaching. Learn, you, a, you learn more about that content yeah. domain. You have to in order right. to do the tu tutoring. But, but also I think the, uh, the, the ancillary effect of um, having these people now skilled a little bit more in group work is a great instructional strategy. Yes. Yeah, I, so it'd be interesting to yeah, I, I, poke around I don't want to take these results and say it didn't work yeah. because I, I think yeah. there's room to improve it. Sure. Um, and again, maybe I need to go to a course that's 14 weeks, you know, just mm. to see if, you know, the, the team the maturity has effect. something to do with yeah. it. And they get used to each other, they trust each other, and like you said, they would participate more having been the tutor. That would really be interesting yeah. to watch. To yes, graph that because peer tutoring time. does work. Sure. It's just that this was the only study done where it was completely online and there wasn't a, an official training for the tutor. Sure. That's it. So we've got a group gathered here uh, in State College and uh, maybe we can generate some questions from this group. We also have uh, the opportunity online and uh, Brad is our um, moderator there so he'll watch for your questions and he'll get those to Joanna. Uh, can I ask the group here anything come of mind here? Um, Top of your mind about group work, teamwork, uh, how to use this? If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself so we the audience knows who you are. I'm a, a graduate student in the Learning Design Technology program, and I have been working on the team project for over a year. I have a question. So, um, in the discussion, um, you mentioned the optimal group size is four, but you conducted four different rounds of 
do your research and students complain that they would like to have more students join their groups, how would you balance the group size? You know, based on the research, the optimal group size for it, but the students are requesting more teammates. I, their request was because they couldn't get engagement from each other, and they were saying if I had more people, then there would be a better chance of getting some engagement. So I think that if we have the team size at four, but I now I also mentioned that the instructor needed to engage a little more with the, with the peer tutor. And if they um, did that, I think over time as they each did it, it there would be more engagement from the students and, and the tutor. So it, I think it really is a, a few things. You know, one is that, that the instructor um, does spend more time and the tutor, and the tutor feels more confident in, uh, in the tutoring. So can just a clarifying point to follow up. Um, so you had four individuals, one of which was the uh, team leader. We'll yeah, call it the, for the week. For the keystone for the week. Okay, just I didn't know whether there yeah. was the fifth one or no, no. Yeah, okay. And then is it like I there were teams of six even, so there'd be one um, peer tutor and then five people on the team. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. So you're on. Uh, yeah, Brad's picking you up. Okay. Um, so you mentioned this um, cognitive um, collaborative um, model. model. So that's a really good one. Um, so for the group assignment, are they require more collaborative skills or cooperative skills? Yeah. Well, Did you they, measure that? They so they were working on the project, and then they were they were looking at the content. They were learning the content. So the CCM. Uh, was in, it was engaged in the project. So in there, they had to do certain tasks. So they asked each other questions, and they had to participate in the, the forum to follow the model. So it, and that was for the project. But the peer tutor was working on the content um, of the of the the course. So in there, the I was just hoping that the, because they worked at on the project in the course, and they were applying that material in the project that the thing the peer tutor was working on was the exam, like, you know, getting them prepared for the exam, that, that those grades would be better because they did the CCM in the project and they had the peer tutor for the content, that the grades would be better. So how would you select the keystone, like the peer tutor? Leader? Well, everyone had to do it. So they were only able to choose which week. So they were able to look at the syllabus and decide which week they felt most comfortable being the tutor. Maybe it was a week they didn't travel. That they said, you know what, I have more time that week. I'm, I want to be too, I want to get it out of the way, I'll do it first. Or I want to wait to do it last. So they, it was really no rhyme or reason. They just, they chose themselves. I didn't force anyone to, to be a tutor any particular week. So if you don't mind, I'm, okay, I'll get to you just once. I just wanted to follow up on Jinx. So I'm really, um, I really enjoy the, uh, uh, the difference between the collaboration and cooperation piece of this. And I'm, and I'm wondering, so as I've done teamwork, I, I'm going to guess I have often fell into the trap of doing cooperation rather than collaboration right, because right. of how I, I build the project and how yeah. I structure it. Do you have um, specific strategies that you would offer a faculty member? I'm thinking, you know, if you want cooperation, here are six things you might do. But if you want collaboration, change this to this by this technique. And you might develop a, you know, more toward the idea of a yeah. true team-based group project. Well, I think very simply, you could have the team uh, participate in drawing a concept map. And that's how I measured that they were collaborating versus cooperating, that those maps actually, I had them do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then I took all the maps and I looked at who was similar and, and compared to the teams that did not use it, those maps were less similar. So I would ha tell an instructor, have them each do a map and then show it to each other. They don't have to go through the whole concept map evaluation technique, but they could see like, oh, you have a concept on, on such and such. I didn't even have that in my project. I didn't even think of that as part of the design. So, you know, just ha then they're having the conversation. That's where they're going to start to get on the same page, and that's, that's really the collaboration because now I know you're going to be working on that. I might hold you accountable to that. I might ask you how it's going and vice versa. So one of the techniques I've often used in uh, group work um, is encouraging the team to then sort of do a divide and conquer. 
Yes. Which I'm guessing is that's more cooperation. Cooperation, but rather not, than I mean, collaboration. in a sense, because unless if you're on the same page, eventually you're going to have to do your own task. Yeah. You know, so I mean, engineers do that all the time. Um, but you you had that beginning piece that analysis was now correct, so that avoids the rework that is often the problem. You know, students in my project management classes will tell me, um, I said, well, why did your project fail? Oh, because they kept adding requirements. So is that really the problem, or was the problem that you didn't understand the project to begin with, and you didn't communicate the right requirements? That's where you missed it. It's not because they yeah. kept adding them; it's because you didn't figure out what they were in the beginning. It was your communicate. There was a communication problem. So any technique, including the concept, yeah. So map, I'm not saying the CCM is, a is the end right. all. Right. It's just what I used. A um, tool. Yeah. But just some tool to get everybody on the same page, make them collaborate right away. Because like even the projects, they end up working out eventually. You give somebody a, a long time, they'll eventually get on the same page, you know, but you want them to be effective. That's why I call it an effective team, because they did it faster. Plus your time frame was really condensed. Seven weeks, right. Yeah, so we you don't have, have a lot ways. of time. Yeah, right, right. right. Good, good, thank you. Kyle, questions? Thoughts? Well, I was going to ask uh, more about the time. Good to see you again. Sorry I was late. I had another okay. thing. Um, so you say the course is just too short. Now, I, I'm hearing now there was a seven-week course. Yeah. Yeah. But do you find the same thing in a semester-long course? And have you thought about ways of combating that? Uh, for example, having cohorts of students or these teams persist from course to course, uh, or perhaps even allowing students to form their own teams where there's already there are already relationships and other things. Have you thought about that's? A, approaching I'm that glad you issue? said that because I forgot to say that these students are in a cohort. They're actually in a software engineering master's program, but this is a very early course. So maybe I could do what you said, suggested and, do, and maybe try this experiment later on in the, in the program in a course where they've mm. now known each other for seven courses and maybe they um, and use a team that um, they were together in this project. So I'd have to work with another instructor to say, could you put them in these same teams and let's uh, look at the data here. So I know in, so this is an engineering context as well, right? Yes, yes. So I know that one of the difficulties in cohorts moving together is there's a lot of fallout from early courses to later courses in a program. Mm -hmm. um, you mean students dropping out? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Students, there are sort of like make or break courses even yeah. that, you know, you, you uh, don't necessarily even expect all the people who take this course to take that next course. Right. So I was wondering about, um, you know, maybe even different designs where, because you mentioned some people were sort of uh, the adults, right? Some just yeah. like dead wood. In yeah, the, yeah. And not, not really contributing. Maybe even sort of some analysis where members could vote somebody off the team and <laughs> put the put the adults yeah. together, the, the, the dead wood together so that they, or somebody has review. to step up because they're, they're capable. Of, yeah, they're I people. could have a peer review. Right. right. So, so sort of like um, yeah, survivor kind of voting somebody off the island. Right. Well, you're top that would be and good. Like moving <laughs> but you know what? It's, it's just like transactional management. You want, mm. you know, you have to motivate them somehow, and maybe something like that, where I know you're going to be rating me, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to mm. do a little better job. I'm going to engage piece, yeah. a little more. Because as you say, in in the real world, they do have to perform quickly, but they know each other. Yeah. So the members from the same firm who come together in teams. Right. Time after time, and so right. maybe if you could kind of replicate that. And it's a so good you idea. Do a fast failure kind of thing. I don't know. I think that's a that's an interesting one. We have these time based constraints that yes. aren't really uh, consistent with the ability of developing long term kinds of right. habits. But, all right. Thanks. Anyone? You can throw it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Josh Kirby. I'm uh, with the Learning Design and Technology Program here at University Park. Uh, so you mentioned that one way you could facilitate the, the process was to have a questionnaire or an essay um, or some other type of uh, shared document that would kind of, as I interpreted it, spark that. Yeah, some worksheet. Yeah, the worksheet. So could you tell us a little bit more uh, about what you would do if you were to, to implement that into future research? Like, how, how would that tool uh, 
how would you develop that tool yeah. and how would the, how do you think that that tool would ultimately help this process for well, the actually groups? it's funny that you say that because I was um, we're redesigning the course not related to this research but we're updating it and one of the things we decided to do was add some homework because um, we felt that they you know they're doing the project um, but they, they really needed something else that they could do uh, just to really get the, the points home of how to do these their UML artifacts that they have to design but maybe throw in some little nuances in there to make them think about other parts of, of the content. So I, I think that would help. And that could be, maybe they could do that as a team. And that could be the worksheet, to do the homework together um, and do, maybe do it synchronously. And then since it's now, I'm grading the team. But see, see, you always wonder, since they're online, like how do I know you're not doing the whole worksheet? You know what, they could, so, you know, I, I don't know. So, I'm, so we're still thinking about that that uh, idea, but I'm thinking of homework, some kind of homework sheet. So I'm, I'm just thinking, because I have, uh, right now I'm involved in, a, in, in teaching a class where we've got teamwork going, yeah. so I'm grabbing everything I can yes. to think, how can we do it better? Um, so one of, the, one of the things I'm wondering about is using the, the structure that you provided in your concept map, um, I'm sorry, in the, in the diagram a few slides back where you provide sort of the, the structure and strategies. If, if Would it be good for an instructor to make those explicit in those teams to say, here's the first thing I want you to do? Oh, that's what I did. That's what you yeah, did. So I you had, provided yes. a preschool. And you could use something like my CZM, just change the questions, not the piece of yeah. so software. Yeah. You know, like yeah. just, they're just questions that you could think of a different, you know, where they're defining the problem, for sure. example. Sure. That's when I have them draw the concept map. You know, I still have them do it, even though I'm not even measuring it right now. I'm not yeah. looking at it. But I know once they do it, it's just a way to communicate to someone else your understanding of a problem. And even if you have them writing an essay, I know there's a researcher here that does that and has them uh, a draw a concept map of, of what they're going to write about. Mm -hmm. So you could apply that to, you know, any domain. So here's a follow-up question then, sort of, sort of related to that is, have you noticed or have you measured the quality of their uh, final projects um, based on whether or not they're using these. And, and the reason I ask that is, is I had a, a colleague years ago who, who used to always warn against groupthink. Yes, you know, yes. Toward the average. You take right. brilliance and you take yeah. not so brilliant and you find something in the middle which is okay but yeah. not you know, brilliant. How do we combat, you know, in this team kind of projects, how do we combat that from occurring? Have you seen it? Is that a phenomenon? Seen group think? Yeah. Yeah, I actually teach that in the engineering ethics uh, course. Um, I have it going on right now. And I had them just watch a video on group think. Um, but yeah, that is uh, something um, where a team will, that, that's a side effect early on where they just want to, again, get going. So they, that's lack of problem analysis. That they just make decisions without understanding the problem. So I think that the CCM would help combat that. And I yes, the answer to your first question was about the projects. That was my first um, experiment that I evaluated their projects. Oh, and I, okay. that's how I said the CCM worked. Oh, I had okay. data that showed that the projects were you know, better, in a sense. They, they understood the problem. And they weren't implementing it again. They were just doing analysis and design. So the problem understanding variable came out better on those teams than the teams that did not use the CCM. So one of the things that COIL was all about is innovation. Yes. I'm just wondering how, is there a, is there a method of, of integrating a step in here that uh, encourages the groups to be thinking beyond even a good response to your, yeah. to your question, an innovative response to their question? Is there some way we could um, create a strategy that kind of bumps up the level of the thinking yeah. outside of what might be normally expected? Yeah. I mean, Sounds like another quail project, right? <laughs> we'll look you want me for, to answer it right we'll now? We'll look for a submission. I'm just kind of thinking that was really big. No, it sounds that's a, great. Yeah, that, that's that, just that like is, an extra. That like, should be the next step. And, yeah. and maybe, so maybe there's a way to get kind of what you might call the normal expected response or yes. something that's within the realm of what right. we do. But then what can we do to stimulate that out-of-the-box response? It may not even be practical, but it's that sort yeah. of next-level innovation. Right. So maybe more of the more of the questioning. Yeah, that is a, it's an interesting interesting question, and I think that would uh, help. Be fun. But it, it's a yeah, yeah, definitely a good innovation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Other thoughts uh, from the group here? Uh, Brad, anything online that we're seeing? Um, Joanna, I, I, I think, and I'm sorry to keep on going on, but as, uh, like I said, I, I, I like this stuff, so it's easy yeah. for me to kind of think through. Uh, your target audience here is primarily adult learners. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Um, All adult learners. So I'm just kind of wondering is how, how would there, would it be necessary to adjust this model for a group of, let's just say, 18 to 22 year old, what we'll call traditional yeah. resident students, or because of their maturity level and experience level, how, how much do you think the age factor impacts the ability of these teams to work effectively and to have good output. Any, any sense of that? Uh, well, as far as the, the CCM goes, I think it would probably work the same. I've never worked with undergraduates mm -hmm. okay. um, on the, with this experiment. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I would think the CCM would be ap applicable. It would work fine. Um, but I would definitely suggest that the peer tutor would need some more extensive tutoring, yeah. uh, you know, uh, training. Right. to be a peer tutor if I wanted to implement this entire experiment in an undergraduate setting. I have thought about that be just to get the 14-week format. Yeah. You know, we yeah. don't have that at my campus, so I have to maybe go to a branch campus and work with a professor there with a 14-week, and that really was something I was thinking about um, in their, they have undergraduates there. So I think that would really be interesting because there may yeah. be another effect going on there as if these are adult learners, they're already gainfully employed in yes. engineering. They're probably already in their workplace yeah, working they in are. teams yes. environments and stuff. So do they have some preparation and orientation to how effective teams already work versus an 18, 22 year well, old who may not? You know, I, my control group was the same demographic. Oh, okay. Okay, so. Okay. No. So you were able to control that. <laughs> I already for that. knew that, that yeah. you know, it's, it's similar demographic, their projects weren't as good yeah. as the teams that I help them okay. collaborate. Oh, so because I, I, as I said in the beginning, it's, it's a skill, you know, and I'm not sure that we teach that everywhere, right. you know, right, or right. if it's if, if part of the training. Uh, and you mentioned this program is a cohort-based program. Does that mean that in every single course they're working on some sort of a group or teamwork project? No, that, no. Not necessarily. It doesn't mean that, no. Okay. They just um, stay together for the duration of the program. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, in the end, the end capstone course of this um, there's definitely a project, but I can't, I don't know for sure in every class if there's a project. And if there is, they're different people. They're randomized. Oh, I see. They're never with the same group. I see. In this particular program. Okay. Thank you. Which is software engineering. Okay. Thoughts, questions from the group here? Robert? software developer, well, a lead engineer in a DevOps type environment and from the operation side. And so most of my team's customers are software development groups around outreach, around our organization. And um, I'm looking for ways to better kick off projects because we continually repeat the same thing where we have an outcome of an expert on a system that was built, um, just like students drop out, we have employees, young employees who come in and then yeah. find other opportunities and leave, and so we don't know the system anymore. Right. Um, and there is a continual disconnect between what the requirements really were yes. and what the software development group's expectations were or requirements were, and then even beyond that, yeah. what the organization's expectations of the collaborative group. So yes. um, I'm just really interested in trying yeah. your CCM as a way of starting a project. That we're going yeah, to and, I, and I also think the issue that you're speaking about is, is a project management um, improvement opportunity. So uh, just you mentioned people leaving, coming, going. Uh, you know, if you, you're going to have to implement some way to have that knowledge stored somewhere. So, and that has to be part of the process. And you might think, uh, it just takes too long. No one's going to want to do it. Um, but it's worth it because think about all the time you spend next month with the new intern or whoever you have uh, learning this, everything again. That should be part of the process for the first person.
to store that knowledge and someone to approve, yep, yeah, okay, you have everything in there that you learned, um, all your best practices. Start doing post-mortems for every person that's leaving before they leave. They do a post-mortem of, of everything, everything that worked well, everything that didn't work, everything they changed for next time. This is what I would have done differently. So the next person who takes that project, they hand it to, they get that information. So it's really, you're, you're talking about project management, and in part of project management is this as well, is the beginning where they have to understand uh, the, the requirements right away, you know, as much as they can. But it's talking with, you know, all the stakeholders, not just the, the people who are, you know, giving them the, um, the project, but other pe who's going to be using it, you know, who's paying for it. So, you know, having everyone involved will help get those requirements out because the user might be thinking something else is coming out um, than the developer is developing. You know, so somehow that, those two people need to get on the same page. Even, and it's not, that's not the person you think is on the team, right, the user, but they are, in a sense. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, project man managing software development. Maybe I should say it like that. Right, but just an outcome yes. of, of architecture and design. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, we have people who, we try to do those things. Yeah. Um, I sat in a meeting yesterday with somebody who, who I work with who said, I have no work because my project was shut down. Well, what about documentation of all the projects you worked on that you never did the documentation of? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I could do something else. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. And, um, and then the other part is, when we have those initial meetings, people come in with preconceived ideas of what they want an outcome. Uh, I was in a meeting yesterday where we were talking about how do we want our hosting environment to look like in three to five years. And so you have players who have vested interests in particular outcomes mm -hmm. and getting people away from solutioning um, and to problem definition, then mm -hmm. it takes away ownership of, of I've got to protect my vested interest yes. by this solution. It's, oh, that's really the problem we're trying to solve. What's the best way to solve the problem and how do I fit into yep. that solution? Right. So, yeah, the problem solving is the first stage. Right. Yeah. Thanks. So, so based on uh, Robert's experience, I'm wondering if there are, um, have you had experiences where your, your students have come back and said, hey, I've taken this model back into my workplace and just to see if it worked, and, and wow, yeah, I've got some positive feedback of that. Anything um, that transfer at all occur? Uh, no. <laughs> well, but it would be good to. It no would one be, ever said that to me. But, I, uh, I that wonder. Would be awesome. Yeah. I wonder it would be if nice if maybe I can get them to apply it and give me some feedback on it. Or even just as a follow up, it yeah. might be interesting to go back to that group and say, hey, you know, you participate yeah. in this program. Anyone? Have you transferred any of this over? These are skill well, sets. Well, you mean my particular project? I mean, they yes. of course transfer all the skills of learning in the program. Oh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but but I, no, I'm saying I'm not sure if anyone's ever used my CCM your at, model. at work. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a good question. So we have a, another question online from Jerry Breezy. Uh, he says, "I often work on proposal teams. The time constraints are always tight. The requirements often ambiguous, and always contain participants who have never worked on a proposal before." It's critical to get novices up to speed on the proposal process. It's also critical to get the proposal pros up to speed on the technical approach to be proposed. We often see combat peer tutoring with technical experts doing temporary proposal duty, focusing on teaching the technical solution, and proposal experts focusing on teaching the proposal novices how to write effectively, etc. These goals usually run into conflict over issues like page count limits, Based on your research with alternating peer tutors, do you have any recommendations for improving their success rate? And success rate meaning um, that the project is not uh, turning out. I guess I'm not understanding. I'm, I'm assuming the, and I'll give Jerry a moment to type here, but I'm assuming that he's meaning in the success rate in uh, constructing a, 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 a successful, a successful proposal, proposal yeah. a well-written proposal, something uh, meaning winning proposals. Oh, winning proposals. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, you know, you can have price to win or you're going to have something, uh, you know, it's really an estimation uh, issue. Um, and then when you're estimating, are you estimating the right requirements? So I think it, what I was hearing is there's something about ambiguous uh, requirements. So 
if you want to have a proposal that's accurate, I'm not sure about the winning part, but if you want one that's accurate that's going to propose a schedule for the correct requirements, that's going to speak again to the beginning that the project was understood to begin with and that the analysis, was that, that enough time was spent so they understood those requirements because if they're ambiguous, you're not going to have a, a proposal that's accurate, the estimation's off, the schedule's off, and then there's, your reputation's going to be off. Because if you do win it, um, even though you, you gave them something that, that looked great on paper, um, you know, you're, you're going to fail. Your, your project's going to go over budget, over schedule, um, and over requirements. So he, he just uh, put a follow-up. How, how will peer, peer tutoring help us solve the team problems, the, the working together, the bringing novices up to speed, the proper allocation of the experts on these teams? Uh, well, someone's going to have to teach the, the team the communication skills in order to, to get, you know, again, the, the project on the, on the right page. Um, so the peer tutors, you could, and, and this, what's the context? There, uh, where is he? Is he at a company? Or? I am not certain, Jerry, if you uh, could respond to that. He's typing in now. Uh, he works for an instructional design firm. Okay. All right. So um, this is are each it's of each person. I you know to avoid him having to type in all the answers to my questions. Um, I guess if if they're having people on the team mentoring, really they're talking about mentoring other people on the team uh, to do a better uh, job to come up with these requirements. I think that whoever the, the leader there may have to. Um, look at the team and see what, what kind of leadership skills are required for those particular people. Um, so, you know, everybody needs something different. And maybe, you know, the novices might need some particular training. Um, and, you know, the peer tutor, instead of focusing on the project, there might be a skill that that person, that novice doesn't understand. So I think there needs to be a leadership piece there to help the peer, peer tutors recognize what's needed on the team first. Uh, because if your team is not effective, your project is, is going to have difficulties. So, Joanna, just as a, a wrap-up question, we're coming to our last minute. Uh, any thoughts on next phases for this study? Where would you like to go next? I would like to um, work on a, a class, like I said, that, that has more time. You okay. know? So, and I would like to, to work with some undergraduates because um, now, but I'm not sure if I should do anything completely online or maybe try a face-to-face version, but I want to stick with the online just because it hasn't been done. Sure. So um, I would have to work with someone that has, a, you know, teaches an online course that's 14 weeks um, mm -hmm. that uh, has a team project that's uh, technical. So if you're out there. Maybe, maybe <laughs> Coyle can help make that connection. I don't know that person. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, on behalf of our audience today, I'd like to say thank, thank you. you. This is really interesting, stimulating uh, thoughts and, and hopefully all of us can take back some lessons from this, but uh, appreciate you joining us in State College, and uh, hopefully the, the weather will improve. Yes. Uh, well, thank you to Coyle, though, my, because Coyle really helped uh, facilitate this, all the work, because I, I had access to um, a, a doctorate in education that I was able to, to put on the project. I had access to someone to help train. There were the resources that I, if I didn't have those, this would have taken me twice as long or never happened. So I do appreciate the, the the uh, help of oil. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you for joining us today. We do appreciate it. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you.